Let me welcome all of you once again for uh, our lecture series on human flourishing in a technological world. Um, today, we have the very important topic of uh, technology and disability. I'm very privileged to have Dr. Eleanor McLaughlin here for, from uh, Oxford. And uh, she's just recently, her research recently earned her the post of the, the, the program. She runs the graduate programs in theology, imagination, and culture at Serum College. And uh, she has written a um, very important book. Uh, it's very versatile, but the last book was on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, the title was Unconscious Christianity in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Late Theology, Encounters with the Unknown Christ. So any one of you interested in Bonhoeffer's idea of religionless Christianity um, and the, the concept of unconscious Christianity, secular thought, and so on, should uh, get that book. And Ellie is also publishing a chapter on, uh, on the material now for our final volume of this, of this lecture series on human flourishing in a, in a technological world. And as I said today, very important topic of disability and technology. Um, uh, it's just, it is thanks to Dr. McLaughlin that I've actually become really interested in that topic. She recommended a book to me. She probably doesn't remember uh, about a year or two ago. Uh, by Reinders that I've read that was deeply impactful. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward, um, Ellie, to what you have to offer us. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'll share my screen and we will kick off. Can someone just give me a wave to check that that's working? Wicked. All right, so um, to consider whether technology contributes towards the flourishing of people with disabilities seems at first to require an obvious answer in the affirmative. We think of our experiences during this current COVID-19 pandemic, and it's obvious that things like online shopping, keeping in touch with people through technological platforms, remote medical appointments, all of these things has helped people with and without disabilities, in fact, to fare much better than would, otherwise, than would otherwise be the case. However, the question becomes a little bit more blurred when we consider the impact of technological advances that have led to procedures such as non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT, or impairment countering surgery. We could think, for example, of limb lengthening surgeries on the lives of people with disabilities. Let's stop for a moment on the example of NIPT. Some people with disabilities and those who care for them, for those people, the consequences of NIPT pose a severe threat to the community of which they are a part. For instance, the campaign group Don't Screen Us Out argues that the effect of NIPT on the Down syndrome community will be long lasting and profound, and that NIPT's effects, quote, enable a kind of informal eugenics in which certain kinds of disabled people are effectively screened out of the population before they are even born, end quote. However, on the other hand, the knowledge about genetic material and the technology which allow NIPT testing have also given rise to more effective treatments for people with chronic illnesses caused by genetic mutations. Can we say, therefore, whether these technological advances encourage or impede human flourishing for people with disabilities? Is it not perhaps more accurate? Right. Yes. Is it not perhaps more accurate to speak of the use of technology as encouraging or impeding flourishing rather than the technology itself? It turns out that the question we should really be asking might actually be, how can we use technology in a way that provokes, promotes flourishing for people with and without disabilities? In this chapter, I investigate this question in four steps. Firstly, Drawing on disability theology, I will contend that relationality is core to a Christian perspective of human flourishing. Second, following Nancy Eastland, the disability liberation theologian, I will outline how the church has historically failed to promote relationality between people with and without disabilities. In the third section, I'll point to the resources within theological discourse or some of the resources within this discourse that help redress this problem, giving an account of Bonhoeffer and Deborah Kremer's thinking in this area. 
I will point in particular to Kramer's work on limits and Bonhoeffer's theological anthropology of ontological limitedness, more on that later, um, arriving at a distinction between specific limits that differ along with our various experiences of embodiment and a common human experience of ontological limitedness. In this central section, I will show that for relationality to be conducive to human flourishing, it must include limitation. Finally, in the fourth step, I will, use the, I will use the view that relationality, which accepts limitation, is the means to human flourishing, as a lens through which to assess our use of technology and its impact on the lives of people with disabilities. But before proceeding any further, I need to just talk about my terminology here. Um, in this presentation, I use people with disabilities and people without disabilities in a very broad brush way. Um, and I tend to include um, conditions uh, like chronic illnesses under this umbrella term disability. It's worth noticing, uh, noting also that for people in this community, uh, the term disabled people is sometimes preferred to people with disabilities. Um, I prefer people with disabilities, but the, the floor is open on that one. Of course, the lived experience of people with disabilities varies drastically from person to person. Um, the experience of someone with a specific disability might be much closer to that of a person with no disability to that of another person with a disability. So this cat categorization is actually very difficult and problematic. Furthermore, for some, the experience of disability fluctuates over time. Some conditions have a disabling effect one day, but are barely noticeable the next. It's therefore important to remember that these two categories, people with disabilities, people without disabilities, are much more fluid, their edges are much more porous than their names suggest. But despite all these caveats, I will be using these two categories uh, today. So let's talk about relationality, part one. Similarly to other theologies of liberation, disability theology begins with the lived experience of marginalized people and seeks to construct a theology that takes that experience seriously as a valid starting point for theological reflection. Scholars like Hans Reinders and John Swinton have taken the experience of people with disabilities as a starting point for theological thought on what it means to be human. Instead of grounding this in abilities, they ground it in relationality. We are human because we are in relation. By highlighting the importance of relationality, Reinders, Swinton and others are continuing the trend within disability within disability theology, to consistently reject the idea that humans flourish through their capacity to do, to think, and to achieve. An approach to human flourishing that is reliant on these capacities, and we'll be talking about Peter Singer in just a second, instantly excludes those who do not think, do, or achieve in ways that society perceives as normal. So in 1993, Peter Singer defined personhood as self-awareness, self-control, a sense of the future, a sense of the past, the capacity to relate to others, concern for others, communication and curiosity. Rather a long list and it involves us being able to be self-aware, to have self-control, to have a sense of ourselves projecting into the future, to be able to do all these things. Importantly, um, when this book was published in 1979, it became an instant classic and it set the tone for a lot of the ensuing conversation about personhood in Christian ethics and theological anthropology, with some people espousing Singer's capacities-based approach and others wanting to dismantle it. The emphasis on relationality instead of on capacity is of course not uncommon among theologians and philosophers. And for obvious reasons, it was one which found a home in disability theology. Rowan Williams presents a similar idea when discussing human consciousness in his book, Being Humans, Minds, Bodies, Persons. Here, Williams suggests that consciousness has four characteristics, and I'm going to focus on the second characteristic that he outlines, which is that consciousness is relational. Williams proposes two contrasting views of the self, the individual view of the self, in which I am the center of the world, one unique example of the group human beings, and the personal view of the self, where I am someone who interacts and engages with others, a point at which relationships intersect, where a difference may be made, and new relations created. In this personal view of the self, 
I know that my own point of view is always partial, and I recognize that I am, quote, a node point in a web of exchange, which corporately constructs the idea of objects, selves, persons. And now we're getting into why I chose this uh, art as the backdrop for the, for the PowerPoint presentation. In the personal view of the self, my sense of self is partially dependent on my understanding of others' views of me. I am aware that other people view me differently to how I view myself, and that is taken into account in what, how I think of myself. However, what is unique about disability theology's contribution here, as opposed to someone like Williams, is the acknowledgement that not everyone can actively achieve a sense of self through interactions with others. For instance, there are people with severe intellectual disabilities who do not, as far as we others can assess, seem to notice when their carers enter or leave the room or wash them or feed them. It's hard to claim, borrowing from Martin Buber's work for a minute here, that these people are honing a sense of the I through buffeting up against the thou of their carer. This is why Reinders, among others, supports the idea that our relational self is grounded in and sustained through our relationality with God. Such a relationality does not require activity on the part of the human self. Further, this relationality with God exists regardless of whether we acknowledge it or are able to be aware of it. God is constantly in relation to us and sustains our relationships with others. For Reinders, we are given to each other by God as friends, independently of our capacity to form friendships. It's an easy move from here to asserting that it is our relationality, our givenness to each other that allows us to flourish. Without it, we are, to quote William's compelling image, a self that assumes that what comes first is this isolated interior core, which then negotiates its way around relations with others, but always has the liberty of hurrying back indoors. Williams describes this self as an individualist awareness, which resents both time and body, resents unfinishedness, resents limitation. On the other hand, the self that does not rush back indoors when it's discomforted by the claims of others is open to being limited by others or to be defined in part by its relationality with others. We'll return to this idea of limitation and the role it plays in relationality. But for now, it's enough to say that it is our being in relation to others that shapes who we are. Relationality is at the core of what it means to be human. Our connection to God and to other human beings allows us to flourish in the sense that it allows us to fully live out what it means to be human. So now let's turn to part two in an overview of disability theology and a perspective from that tradition on how the church has historically supported the us-them divide between people with and without disabilities, thus preventing people to flourish through being in relation with each other. Nancy Eastland, whose book, The Disabled God Towards a Theology, Towards a Liberatory Theology of Disability, opened up the conversation of disability theology. And she's acerbic in her critique of the church's role in maintaining the separation between people with and without disabilities. Her analysis of the way in which Christianity has traditionally marginalized people with disabilities comes from her experience of having a disability and of being a Christian. This combined experience gives her a powerful and persuasive voice. She identifies four main characteristics within Christian practice which prevent the full inclusion of people with disabilities, and she begins by pointing to the way people with disabilities have been stereotyped. And she writes, the persistent thread within the Christian tradition has been that disability denotes an unusual relationship with God and that the person with disabilities is either divinely blessed or damned, the defiled evildoer or the spiritual superhero. As is often the case with such starkly contrasting characterizations, neither adequately represents the ordinary lives and lived realities of most people with disabilities." End quote. Denied the option of being ordinary, people with disabilities are portrayed as other, making it difficult for the relationships between those with and without disabilities to remain in the realm of the ordinary. Second, Iceland writes Iceland, people with disabilities have further been ostracized through the identification of disability with sin, or otherwise put a travesty of the divine image. 
and an inherent desecration of all things holy. This, this, depiction, this depiction of disability also has an effect on the relationship between people with and without disabilities. While those with disabilities are judged or suspected for their supposed sin, those without disabilities learn to be wary or learn to be pitying of them. Eastland argues further that in the Christian tradition, people with disabilities have been presented as having an opportunity to be ideals of virtuous suffering. This again sets people with disabilities apart from ordinary people, quote, ordinary people. It's worth quoting in full Eastland's condemnation of this practice. And I've realized I haven't put this on the PowerPoint. I'm sorry, I'll just, I'll just read it slowly. She writes, the biblical support of virtuous suffering has been a subtle but particularly dangerous theology for persons with disabilities. Used to promote adjustment to unjust social situations and to sanction acceptance of isolation among persons with disabilities, it has encouraged our passivity and resignation and has institutionalized depression as an appropriate response to divine testing. In addition to encouraging passivity and resignation, this is me again, among people with disabilities, this behavior also separates those with disabilities from others by making them into models of virtuous suffering that can serve as an inspiration to the ordinary members of the community. The fourth and final facet of Eastland's critique of the church's behavior towards people with disabilities is the way in which it has divorced the search for justice from charitable giving. She notes that the early biblical prophetic calls to help the needy, for instance, Amos 5, 12 to 15, were accompanied by, accompanied by calls to seek justice, and that in practice, the two have been detached from each other. This means, of course, that individuals and congregations can continue to practice charitable giving, excuse me, while neglecting the political needs of people with disabilities and ceasing to fight for social inclusion for all. In this way, too, the relationships between people with and without disabilities has become frayed and torn. It's easy to see how, according to this view shared by many Christians with disabilities, the separation between those with and without disabilities has been perpetuated through Christian teaching. This is not to say that there are no Christian spaces in which people can flourish together. Sadly, though, the traditional approaches identified by Eastland are widely recognized in disability theology and in the experiences of people with disabilities, perhaps not all together at the same time, but elements of these critiques continuously find echoes in people's um, experiences. However, despite Christian theology's historical failure to understand that the relational core of human flourishing applies to all humans, including those with disabilities, we can nevertheless turn to theology for help in overcoming this divide and thus strengthen relationships between all people. Who do we turn to? We turn to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in him we find a theologian who is aware of the importance of right relationships between human beings. He writes specifically about the relationships between people with and without disabilities in a sermon that he preached in 1934 when he was a pastor in London, uh, preaching to his congregation on 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Bonhoeffer drew on his experience of a visit to uh, a village called Bethel made the previous year in Germany. The village of Bethel was a community set up to care for people with illnesses and disabilities. And Bonhoeffer had been there and worshipped alongside people with epilepsy in the village church. He'd been profoundly touched by this experience and wrote to his grandmother about it. Um, in particular, he noted their inability to defend themselves from sudden fits of epilepsy and their reliance on others to help them when they experienced their, their fits. Um, and in his letter, Bonhoeffer writes, the situation of being truly defenseless perhaps gives these people a much clearer insight into certain realities of human existence. The fact that we are indeed basically defenseless that can be possible for help, than can be possible for healthy persons. We're flirting on the edge of them being spiritual superheroes here, but I think what Bonhoeffer, he's not quite doing that because he's just giving them um, the, <sighs> I wanted to say the kudos, but giving them um, 
allowing them to have an insight which he couldn't have had himself. So I think it's, it's slightly different here, although we could debate that. Sensing that there are insights to be gained from being in community with a more diverse group of people, in his sermon, Bonhoeffer warns against the attitudes of benevolence and beneficence that prevail in Christian communities towards those with disability. And this is the quote on the slide. He writes, in the attitude of benevolence and beneficence, the seriousness of the problem is not at all recognized. Weakness to them, the people without disabilities, is nothing but imperfection. But this includes, of course, that the higher value in itself is strength and power. Strength and weakness are considered in the proportion of the perfect and the imperfect. Here, Christianity must protest. With all due respect for the real sacrifices that have been made in such a benevolent attitude, it must be said frankly that this approach is wholly wrong and unchristian, for it means condescension instead of humility. In Bonhoeffer's desire to replace condescension with humility, we can see the desire to create real relationships between people. Relationships that are based on the desire to learn who the other is, instead of assuming that we know that already. Put differently, this attitude towards the other person allows them to be who they are, instead of trying to mold them into what we expect or think they should be. This is the sort of relationality that truly allows human flourishing as it is non-oppressive and open to the other. Bonhoeffer explores this model of relationality in more detail in two of his works, Creation and Fall and Life Together. In the former, he addresses it through the language of limit and limitedness, and that's what we will look at in a bit more detail. While in the latter, he does so in terms of the types of community created by different types of relationships. We'll first turn to creation in full to examine how Bonhoeffer's understanding of limit and limitedness can inform our discussion of human flourishing. So creation in full is uh, made up of a series of lectures that uh, Bonhoeffer gave at the University of Berlin on Genesis 1-3 to in 92, 30, 92, no, 1932 to 1933. In these lectures, Bonhoeffer uses the image of the tree of life in the middle, middle of the Garden of Eden to express the idea of God being at the center of human existence. Commenting on Genesis 2, 16, 17, the prohibition of eating from the tree of knowledge, he writes, the life that comes from God is at the center. That is to say, God who gives life is at the center. At the center of the world that has been put at Adam's disposal and over which Adam has been given dominion is not Adam himself, but the tree of divine life. Adam's life comes from the center, which is not Adam, but God. It revolves around this center constantly without ever trying to take possession of this center of existence. Adam is not in temptation to touch the tree of life, to seize hold of the divine tree at the center. Put in other words, Adam's life comes from God and God occupies the center of Adam's existence. Adam is limited in the sense that he is not at the center of his own existence. Bonhoeffer understands Adam's existence at this point in the Genesis narrative as one as com of complete obedience to the command of God. It does not even occur to Adam to transgress his limit. He simply lives within it, experiencing neither positive nor negative emotion about this situation. Another way in which Adam experiences limitedness is in his relationship with Eve. And in this relationship, we see the beginnings of the possibility that limitation in our relationships with others can be positive. Not only does Eve limit Adam in the sense that she places physical limits on him, for instance, he cannot occupy the same place that she occupies, but she plays another role too. For Bonhoeffer, commenting on Genesis 2, 21, 22, the fact that Eve originates in the same flesh as Adam means that Eve can represent Adam's limit to him in a specific way. She represents his life, his center, that which God alone possesses. Thus Eve reminds Adam of his limit, reminding him of the fact that he is commanded not to take possession of the center of his existence. As Eve bears the limit to Adam, so does Adam bear the limit to Eve. It's perhaps easier to see how the limit that Adam sets for Eve can be seen as a manifestation of God's grace. So Bonhoeffer talks about the prohibition of eating from the tree of knowledge actually being a gift of grace 
from God, because Bonhoeffer defines grace as that which holds humankind over the abyss of non-believing, uh, non-being, sorry, non-living, not being created. And so it's easy to see, but with this definition, that the prohibition that God gives Adam can be defined as grace because it keeps him from non-being, non-living and not being created. The prohibition keeps him in this relationship of obedience to God. But Eve can present that manifestation of God's grace as well. Adam loves Eve and in recognizing that she represents his limit to him, he is able to love this limit. Bonhoeffer unpacks this in a section that it is worth quoting in full, although it is a bit of a long one. So he says, knowing the other person as God's creature, simply as the other, as the other who stands beside me and constitutes a limit for me. And at the same time, knowing that the other person is derived from me, from my life, and so loving the other and being loved by the other because the other is a piece of me. All that is for Adam, the bodily representation of the limit that should make Adam's limit easier for Adam to bear. In other words, love for a person helps one to bear the limit. The other person is the limit that God sets for me, the limit that I love and that I will not transgress because of my love. This means nothing other than that both people, while remaining two creatures of God, belong to one another in love. By the creation of the other person, freedom and creatureliness are bound together in love. That is why the other person is once again grace to the first person, just as the prohibition against eating from the tree of knowledge was grace. Essentially, then, what we have here is the idea that loving the person who limits us or who represents our limit to us helps us to bear that limit. The other person represents God's grace to me by reminding me of the prohibition against possession of the center of my own existence and thereby pushing God out of the center of my existence. In life together, if we move on to a different text in Bonhoeffer's opus, Bonhoeffer picks up this reflection in rather different terms. Here, his concern is how people can flourish in communal life, so more than just two people in relation to each other. And he writes specifically about Christian community. He highlights the fact that in communities that are there are often some individuals who try to dominate others in order to shape the community into something that fits their ideal. Warning against this, Bonhoeffer points to the importance of having something that limits the interaction between individuals, presenting this kind of dominating or domineering behavior. For Bonhoeffer, that something is Christ himself. He writes, Christ stands between me and others. By standing between each individual and the next, Christ limits each person's power over the other person. In both creation and fall and life together, we can see that for Bonhoeffer, being limited is part of being human, or at least being limited is part of being a flourishing human being. Recognizing, recognizing limits in our relationships with others, both with God and with other human beings, allows us to be with others in a way that promotes human flourishing. According to Bonhoeffer, our being limited symbolically represents the grace that is our reliance on God rather than reliance on ourselves and the ability to live alongside each other in loving and flourishing community. This focus on limits has resonances in disability theology and in particular in the work of Deborah Creamer, to which we now turn. Deborah Creamer proposes a new theological category for thinking about disability, which links closely with Bonhoeffer's idea of ontological limitedness. Creamer articulates her theological model of disability in relation to biomedical and socio-political models of disability, which will just skim over before coming to Creamer's own thinking. So in the biomedical model of disability, the disability is the problem and it needs to be fixed. The person with the disability is considered individually rather than as part of a group of people with disabilities. And the person with the disability, quote, understands that he or she belongs to a devalued group. That's according to Smart and Smart in that article there. Oops. Um, according to the socio-political model, which is also sometimes called the minority model, um, 
The prejudice and the discrimination that people with disabilities face are the problem which needs to be fixed, which, yeah. In this model, people with disabilities view themselves as a minority group, which is oppressed by the majority. And here, people with disabilities do not view themselves as belonging to an inferior or devalued group. So just a totally different way of, of coming at things. Now, Creamer's model, she says, and I quote, pays attention to the fluidity of human embodiment and most particularly the claim that limits are an unsurprising aspect of being human. Limits are normal, she writes, rather than acting as a deficit, they lead us toward creativity and even toward God. So Creamer here is suggesting that using the category of limits allows us to see human beings as being no better or no worse than we actually are. We all have limits. In other words, experiencing limits is simply a common reality for humanity. Creamer suggests that if we stop to think, we would need to say that everybody has limits. It's true that some limits would still be considered more normal than others. So for instance, none of us can fly yet. Although this is clearly a limit that we have, it's considered normal to be unable to fly. Being unable to walk is a similar limit because it has to do with how we get from point A to point B, but the latter limit is not usually considered normal. However, despite this imbalance between limits which are considered normal and limits which are considered not normal, there is still in this limits model the idea that limits themselves are an intrinsic part of being human. In addition, Creamer's model allows the experience of having limits that has been traditionally attributed to people with disabilities only as being shared by all humans. So the possibility of breaking down barriers between disabled and non-disabled people helps with some of the main problems that the church has faced when trying to deal with the question of disability, as we outlined above. Prima's model of the common human experience of limitedness breaks down the us and them barriers that the constructs outlined above promote. Instead, it asks us all to consider what our limits are and how they affect us. It's extremely important to note here that Creamer does not advocate an obedient acceptance of all of our limits. Indeed, Creamer is interested in the creativity that people use to overcome their limits. And we can talk about examples of that afterwards. Creamer is certainly not proposing that we all sit quietly within our limits if we can and would prefer to try to overcome them. Rather, what she's calling for is a realization that limits do not only apply to one group of people who should therefore all be lumped together in one category apart from everyone else. Limits are a normal part of human life and thinking of them as such will help us approach the question of disability in a way which does not alienate people from each other. Bonhoeffer would agree that being limited is an ontological reality for humanity, at least before the fall, and we can come back to that question as well. And one which in fact allows humans to flourish in their relationship with God and with each other. My claim here then is that Creamer's emphasis on the importance of the shared experience of having limits as a common and undeniable feature of human existence brings us closer to a way of being that Bonhoeffer would characterize as living in relationship with God that allows us to flourish. A way of being human that allows humans to flourish simply as creatures before God. This is not something that Creamer herself articulates, but I think it can be layered onto Creamer's work without distorting her own aims. So Creamer emphasizes the common experience of having specific embodied limits and powerfully argues that when these limits are denied, harm is done. And here she's writing, limits are a normal and unsurprising aspect of life. Yet we choose, for whatever reason, to stigmatize some and normalize others. When we dismiss disability as being an exceptional and othering experience, we deny the normality of limits in all of our lives, pretend that we do not experience increasing limits as we age, and even refuse to acknowledge the future limit of death. In these denials, we live a lie, a lie that harms other people, those on whom we project and reject these limits, the environment, when we pretend that it also has no limits, and even ourselves. <clears throat> 
we can no longer consider what it is to be embodied, to have race, gender, sexual orientation, power, politics, religion, without also considering what it is to have embodied limits. We can no longer ignore reflection on experiences of disability and other embodied limits in our theological constructions. We must attend to the values that we place on limits, including on people with visible and profound limits, and must challenge our notion of what it is to be normal." End quote. So we may choose, we may not choose, sorry, we may not choose which limits to stigmatize and which to normalize without reinforcing many exclusionary barriers, including ones which keep disability, people with disabilities from those with disabilities. And I keep coming back to this division, the us them barrier, which um, for a long time Christian tradition has really reinforced. So to kind of sum up what I'm trying to do by putting Bonhoeffer and Kramer in conversation with each other here, by incorporating Bonhoeffer's insights into Kramer's model, we arrive at a model in which each individual is aware, at least in part, of some of their own specific limits, as well as having a sense of ontological limitness, limitedness shared with all human beings. This sense of ontological limitedness imparts the understanding that the individual does not need to be all knowing because in Bonhoeffian terms, she does not need to occupy the center of her own ex existence. As many have pointed out, the problem arises then of identifying which limits we may or may not attempt to creatively overcome and which are simply constitutive of our ontological limitedness. A thorough treatment, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, can't be attempted here, but we can discuss that uh, afterwards. But I suggest that being attentive to the impact of these limits on our relationships with others is a vital component of assessing which limits we can attempt to overcome and what experiences are constitutive of our ontological limitedness. In contrast to specific limits, however, Ontological limitedness, the very fact that part of being human is to experience limitedness, should not be erased if we are to retain our creatureliness before God. By allowing Bonhoeffer to contribute anachronistically to Kramer's model, we are reminded that it is through our experience of ontological limitedness that God manifests God's grace to us, allowing us to flourish in our relationship to God and that Christ limits and mediates our relationships with each other, allowing us to flourish in our lives together. So let's now move on to uh, an uh, evaluation of our use of technology. Just checking if I need the next slide, not yet. So the framework given to us by this distinction between specific limits and ontological limitedness allows us to assess the use of technology positively when it helps us overcome specific limits which prevent us from flourishing, and negatively when it attempts to eradicate the state of ontological limitedness of humanity in and of itself. Further, the recognition that relationality, if it is to be, if it really, if it is really to be at the core of human flourishing, can never be coercive, but must always be limited in some ways. And that helps us evaluate technology in terms of whether or not it's being used to secure control or domination of one individual or group over another. This framework gives us a way to engage with technology that encourages creative human flourishing, but protects human limitedness itself, thus protecting our potential to experience God's grace in embodied life. It also shows us that our engagement with technology should not give anyone the capacity to relate to others in a way that erases the limits between us as we saw in life together. So let's bring in Neil Messer here, um, bioethicist and theologian, and he uh, references what I've called the state of ontological limitedness in his discussion of technological projects in his book Selfish Genes and Christian Ethics. Theological and Ethical Reflections on Evolutionary Biology. In his discussion of freedom, sin, and salvation, Messer suggests that there are some diagnostic questions we can ask in order to, as he puts it, discern whether any particular technological project goes with or against the grain of God's saving work, end quote. One of these questions is, 
Is the project an attempt to be like God or does it conform to the image of God? Messer, as I have done here in this presentation, is drawing on Bonhoeffer's work in Creation and Fall to frame his question. And he advocates for an assessment of technological projects that examines the internal logic, as it were, of the different forms of activity, not necessarily of the conscious motivations or intentions of the agents in these technological projects. But what I propose here is that our framework does allow us to also ask questions about these agents and their intentions in terms of how their use of technology will impact their relations with others. The technologies that people with disabilities use or are affected, affected by are of course too many to comprehensively survey in one essay. However, it's easy to see how some technologies help people with disabilities creatively overcome specific limits. We talked about online shopping during a COVID pandemic at the top of this presentation, but we can think of online discussion groups in which people can meet, chat, participate in social networks, um, play games, even if they can't move from their beds. Uh, we can think about medical technology, for instance, glucose monitoring systems that allow people with diabetes to check their glucose levels through a sensor on their skin, through a mobile phone instead of doing a finger prick test. These and myriad other technologies impact the day-to-day -day lives of people with disabilities, helping them overcome specific limits in creative ways. On the other hand, there are examples of technology being used to eradicate limitness itself. For instance, during China's one child policy in the 80s through to 2016, medical technology allowed the identification and abortion of female fetuses. Here, the limit considered to be a disadvantage was being female and these limited lives were prevented from continuing. These are, of course, really obvious examples to give. And so far, there does not seem to be much here that would cause any heated debate. But it's interesting to then return to the idea of relationality outlined earlier in the, chat, in the presentation. Our relationships with others and with God enable us to flourish. As we saw when drawing on Bonhoeffer, these relationships must have limits set on them to prevent individuals from trying to dominate or manipulate others. Therefore, technologies which attempt to remove relationality or remove certain limits from our relationality can be deemed to inhibit human flourishing. Viewed in this light, our assessment of technology becomes much more complex. Returning to the example of online discussion groups, we see that these can help some people with disabilities to flourish by being in relation with others, creatively overcoming the limits which impede their relationships with others in the offline world. However, as in any sort of human relationship, there is the potential for someone in an online discussion group to try to coerce others, attempting to assert herself over the other people in the chat room. For Bonhoeffer, such a move implies that this, imp that this person no longer recognizes the limit that others represent to her. As hinted at in the introduction, we arrive at the conclusion, not that the technology itself is helping or impeding human flourishing, but it is our use of it that can tip the balance between supporting or impeding human flourishing. In the medical arena, the, consequence of the consequences of the use of technologies such as NIPT allow us to identify types of human beings who are perceived as being more limited. And these consequences are extremely concerning. Decisions made about who is or isn't more limited that um, seem to rely on the recurring divide between people with and without disabilities, where having a, disabilities, having a disability is linked to being more limited or being limited, while not having a disability is linked with not being limited. Iceland's trend towards having no population with Down syndrome is a case in point. Here, instead of, or ironically perhaps alongside, developing technologies that would help people with Down syndrome overcome specific limits that can come with the condition, like having poor muscle tone, for example. This way of being human, this particular embodiment of human limitedness is being eradicated. On the flip side, technologies like prenatal genetic screening may play a role which supports human flourishing 
Expectant parents may use the information collected during the procedure to better prepare for the needs of their child and think ahead to ways to help it creatively overcome the limits it may encounter. Again, it seems to be our use of technology that can prevent or support human flourishing. The NIPT question, other similar questions and campaigns around these raise the relationality question at a societal level. They force us to ask what limits we are prepared to accept when living in a shared society. Am I prepared to be in relationship with someone whose visibly different embodiment reminds me of my own limitedness? Or to use William's words, am I someone who resents both time and body, resents unfinishedness, resents limitation? Do people whose bodies fit within the traditional, traditionally acceptable category want to be reminded that they are only, to quote Eastland, temporarily, temporarily able-bodied? Do people whose bodies have traditionally been portrayed as inadequate want to participate in a society where this view might be repeated to them? These questions extend to all of us. Do we want to live in ways that remind us of our own limits and our own limitedness? The way that we think about our relationality and limitedness will dictate our use of technology. It might compel us to dominate and exclude and suppress reminders of our ontological limitedness, or it might direct us towards understanding and inclusion, seeking ways to overcome specific limits while being faced by an while being willing to be faced by and embrace both our own and others' ontological limitedness. So to conclude very briefly. The framework proposed here not only allows us to assess the use of technology in the lives of people with disabilities, it also allows the strengthening of relationships between people with and without disabilities. The views of disability within the Christian tradition that Eastland identifies are overturned when we adopt the approach that I propose here. Briefly then, first, people with disabilities can no longer be classified as superheroes or evildoers, because both people with and without disabilities are all alike considered as experiencing both specific limits and ontological limitedness. Second, having rejected the idea that people with disabilities are limited, whereas those with dis without disabilities are not, the link between disability and sin and travesty of the divine image cannot be maintained. Third, accepting that people may and should attempt to creatively overcome specific limits, allows people with disabilities who desire to overcome their limits to try to do so. Thus the idea of virtuous suffering cannot, can no longer be routinely imposed on them. Fourth, where there is true relationality between people, allowing each to flourish, there cannot be charity without calls for justice. The kind of relationality that recognizes our own limits and limitedness and those of others spurs us on to both love and to secure the best for our friends. Thank you very much for listening.